Good morning and welcome to our final grand rounds of this session. I'm Maya Hendel, the education manager here at MHIF and just wanted to thank everyone for joining us for this season. We will take a break over the summer and be back September 13th. So we look forward to seeing you then. I wanted to thank all of our sponsors who have sponsored us over this season and we've got Jansen and Amgen here with us today. And then finally a reminder to please fill out the evaluation that you've gotten a link for and I'll send another reminder. So thank you for doing that. And I'll pass it over to Dr. Newell. Good morning everyone, thanks for joining and, and thanks for those online for joining as well. Well, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce our, our final speaker for the series. So Jordan, welcome. Uh, Dr. Jordan Strom is the Director of Echocardiography Research at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and he's an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School. I received his BS in, in biology from Yale and actually his MD from Harvard Medical School. Um, he trained then in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital and uh, in cardiovascular medicine at Beth Israel. Uh, he's a chief fellow there from 2017 to 2018 and uh, received postgraduate training in clinical epidemiology and biostatistics at the Harvard T.H. Uh, Chan School of Public Health and got his master's in science and epidemiology in May of 2018. So he's also the inaugural fellow and is currently a faculty investigator at the Richard A. and Susan F. Smith Center for Outcomes Research in Cardiology. Uh, his research includes uh, evaluation of relationship of cardiac structure and function to health outcomes, uh, particularly in valvular heart disease. His research focuses on the optimal use and timing of cardiac imaging in practice. He specializes in the analysis of large administrative uh, registry and clinical trial data, so it does a lot of big data work as we'll hear about today, and uh, in particular with imaging registries. Uh, he's received grant funding for his work from the American Heart Association, from the NIH, and others, and has published more than 50 peer review uh, manuscripts already uh, in his early career, including Circulation, European Heart Journal, Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, he does a lot of editorial work as well, and uh, does a guest editor and editorial board member for a Journal of the American Society of Echocardiography, is a member of the ACC Imaging Council Leadership Committee. Also of interest, he was one of the inaugural members of the uh, ASC's Leadership Academy. So we talked about that on the way here, which was quite interesting to hear about. And uh, also one of the inaugural members of the ASC Board of Directors in this capacity for, for the leadership piece, which is wonderful. Um, we'll keep going here. <laughs> You've got quite the CV. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, it's a good time. <laughs> He's also the co-chair of the Image Guide Echo Research and Publications Committee and a member of the Image Guide Echo Registry Committee, serves on the Public Relations Committee, is very active on Twitter in this uh, capacity, and actually has moderated several ASE journal clubs uh, via Twitter. Um, he also works, uh, again, as I mentioned, in the ASE Leadership Academy Selection Task Force. He's also an ACC representative on the Board of Directors and the Joint Review uh, Committee on Education and Diagnostic Sonography, so works with sonographer education as well. So today, uh, Jordi will be talking about uh, demonstrating the value of imaging, the role of outcomes research, and big data in cardiac imaging. So, Jordi, welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, thank you for that great introduction, and, um, and it's really a pleasure to be here and an, and an honor. Um, so today, um, I'm, I'm going to be taking a, a, a sort of a 10,000-foot view uh, a little bit and what we do um, day, day to day in imaging and, and saying, can we really use the data that we are acquiring by doing imaging to leverage that to really understand how, how to best take care of the patients that we, um, we see in front of us? And so um, these, uh, these are my disclosures. So and this, this story really starts actually not in the imaging, uh, uh, not, not within cardiology, but really within sort of radiology and overall sort of hierarchy of, of sort of imaging um, um, uh, evidence that's been sort of built as part of radiology over the course of many, many years. And um, uh, several years ago, Thornbury and Freiback were radiologists who um, developed a sort of schema um, for evidence generation within the context of imaging. And they, they suggested that, it, you know, at the very sort of base of, of the, the pyramid or the very sort of base of, of what we needed to uh, identify is the, the technical efficacy or sort of ability to be able to, you know, um, uh, image appropriately. Um, and then above that, 
Um, you have things like diagnostic accuracy, whether or not there's therapeutic accuracy to a, to a given technology. And ultimately, at the very top of, of the pyramid is the societal, uh, societal efficacy or the societal impact. And what they reasoned was, was that, in fact, you can't get to a higher rung in this pyramid before, moving, before making sure that you have evidence that uh, supports the, 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 under, um, the, the other tiers. That said, the clinical impact is sort of a reverse pyramid in that the, the, uh, the higher up in the pyramid you go, the more and broader the impact potentially could be of the kind of data that you ultimately generate. And this has been applied to, um, to cardiology. This is a, from Fort, um, Fordyce and Douglas, Pam Douglas and others uh, in Jack Imaging in 2017. And they, say, they basically turned the, um, the, the pyramid into a, a, a layer of sort of concentric cir circles or target and applied this if in particular in this, in this uh, article to talking about CT and how CT has evolved as a technology um, to include the, um, not just the adequate technical efficacy for evaluation of obstructive coronary disease, but now well, the, this outer rung, this outer circle, which is you know, how do we really understand how CT affects um, eff efficiency, minimizes cost, improves quality of life, and, and improves ultimately morbidity, mor mortality, and long-term outcomes. Um, and so this is where we are, I think, with, with CT, and it's where I, I think we can be with, with a lot of sort of other um, modalities in imaging. And so fundamentally, this comes down to the sort of core attributes of what, what are we actually looking for when we're, we're doing an image um, test. And we want to make sure, for example, that it's accurate, that it's reproducible. There are some tests um, that are, are, are ultimately relevant, that it's, it's available. Um, but then ultimately, at the end of the day, we, we really have sort of broader questions that does it alter clinical diagnosis or management? Does it alter patient outcomes? Um, and, and does it ultimately Im improve or change resource utilization, is, and is it cost effective? And, and why, why do we want to focus on the sort of cost effectiveness? Well, I think this is um, uh, maybe familiar to sort of many people in the room, which is you know, we, we have uh, an imaging cost issue um, in the United States, and I think this is, uh, this is relatively old data. This is, oops, excuse me, didn't mean to click there. Um, this is um, from 2006. But, but in, in, uh, this trend has, has in part continued with imaging. This is just representing, um, this is from New England Journal. This is looking at growth in, in the volume of physician services per beneficiary over the course of several years. And you can see here that the, in the purple here, or blue, um, I guess depending on your perspective here, is, um, is, is imaging services. And so you can see that the growth in imaging services over the course of, of the last couple decades has really outpaced um, that of, of, of really other major procedures and other testing. And this is uh, not just unique to cardiology overall. Um, so what, what are we actually doing in the Uni United States? And how many image tests are we doing? And, and, and I can have to say that there's actually very little, surprisingly little data on, on this out there that's been published in terms of what the actual trends are. But if we look at Canada, um, this is just the rate of echocardiograms. This is from a Jack Imaging article in 2013. The rate of echocardiograms done for per 1,000 persons um, over the course of, um, of many years. And you can see there's, there's obviously a very sort of linear trend. And what's really interesting here is in the, um, if you look not just at rate of echocardiograms as a whole uh, increasing, but r rates of repeat echocardiograms, that is people who had an echocardiogram recently who, had, uh, who now have it repeated, you can see here in the triangles that that's really increased at a faster rate and a faster clip than, than that of all echocardiograms as a whole. And so we, we have a, a, a repeat, or at least in Canada, they, they have a repeat um, echo issue. And I can tell you probably uh, it, it's similar in, in the United States. And this is sort of looking a little bit sort of more granular into this, and, and, and you can look at the percentage of people who have one or two or three or four repeats, and, and you can see it's quite high. Then 2009 here, there was 17.3% of all individuals who had at least one uh, repeat echo um, in, in this Ontario group that was studied. Um, and, um, and, and the number of repeats, interestingly enough, when you sort of dig into this a little bit more, performed by the same physician was about half, which means that about half, over half, um, were performed by a different physician. So of all uh, echocardiograms uh, that were performed on a given individual in, in this year, you know, more than half of it were performed by a different individual. And so when we, when we look at that in terms of rate of change and uh, by, by specialty, you can see uh, we're doing pretty well in, in cardiology. I think we're pretty similar to internal medicine here in our repeat rate of, of, of echoes is about 13%, or at least this is, in, in, I should say, in Canada. Um, 
Whereas radiology, you can see there's been a, there's been a huge um, uh, I increase in repeat echoes. But this is not unique to to um, to, to internal medicine referees or or radiology referrals. You know, we are also uh, guilty of this w within cardiology uh, of repeating echoes. So it sort of begs the question: Why are we repeating images so much? Do we not trust each other's reads and values, and it, or is there another clinical need to, to identify what, um, what is, uh, is ultimately going on? So how about, well, that's echo. What about um, overall multimodality imaging? Of course, that's a, a, a larger uh, fish to fry here. And so let's look at this, this article from um, uh, Jim Open. This is also from the same Canadian group looking at uh, utilization of multimodality imaging over uh, time. And you can see that um, echo, in particular stress echo, is, is still by far and away um, you know, the, the most common um, form of imaging, although if you count this ICA is invasive coronary angiography and this is MPS is myocardial perfusion and scintigraphy. So if you count those, those, those are uh, dominating the, the, the spheres here outside of just transthoracic echo. But then you see a rise also in, in cardiac MRIs and, and, and CTs. And by and large, those are still small in volume compared to echoes. Um, and if you look at overall total cost of multimodality imaging, the total cost has been increasing over the course of, of, of the last decade. And in particular, um, even though uh, advanced imaging modalities are here at the bottom, you can see CT and MR. Everybody says, oh, well, you know, that, that MRI is so expensive. Well, in fact, actually, it, 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 the rate and the cost of, uh, it is relatively uh, small when you compare that to resting echocardiography, where, and you can see that, that there's, there's really a trend towards an increased rate of use of, of echo. So, okay, so back to the US. Well, what, what do we have in terms of data in the United States? This is from um, uh, the Agency for Health, uh, Healthcare Research and Quality, or ARC, publishes these data points, which are sort of synopses of the, of the data um, uh, every, uh, every once in a while. And they, they chose in 2011 to do one looking at specifically at echocardiographic services. And so this is just um, um, a graph showing the, the percent receiving echoes um, these are Medicare beneficiaries within a given year, and you can see that 80% of people um, received at least one echo, and 15% received two. So this is 80% of all Medicare beneficiaries receive at least one echo per year, and 15% two. Uh, so I will just let that sink in for a second and say, are we doing enough imaging, or are we doing a lot of imaging in this country? Um, I mean, it's an astronomical amount, and, and to, to the point that uh, you know, this is almost becomes a public health issue because we have so many people, um, you know, the, the things that we do on ECHO and the report on ECHO ultimately become public health issues because we have so many people who are, who are receiving it. And there's a, there's a wide variation in, in terms of the rates of use. You can see here New York and Florida stand out as being very high, um, uh, high rates of use, whereas there are other parts of the country uh, where, where it's not being used um, as much. Um, Minnesota up here. So, um, why do we ultimately at the need, need to, to demonstrate value? Well, you know, if you just did a simple comparison and you said, what, what, what actually happens to people when they get an echo? Do they die? How much does it cost? Do, what's their hospitalization cost look like? Um, and, and I title this Caution Advice, and I'll tell you why in a second, because I think what you see here, and this is from an article in Jack in 2016, you can see that as the rate of, this is looking at an, a national inpatient sample um, analysis, and as the rate of echo has increased, um, there, there's, of course, been a compensatory increase in, in hospitalization charges. But in, in fact, actually, there's been a decline in the trend of hospitalization mortality and length of stay. Um, and if you look at just heart failure hospitalizations as a whole, um, you can see here um, in this um, forest plot that the mortality is lower, so to speak, in, in individuals who receive echoes, um, although echo was only performed in about 8% of heart failure hospitalizations. And what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that there's a really strong selection bias here. Um, and, and it tells you, I think, that um, echo is not necessarily saving lives, though I think it's hard to sort of disentangle uh, this, but, but that people who get echoes live long enough to receive that echo. And so therefore, you know, if they're really crashing and burning, coming in very sick, cardiogenic shock, they may not have the time to actually have this uh, echo. And, and also, it associates with sort of intensity of services, et cetera. So I'm not sure I would take this as, as a, uh, a means to say that echo actually saves lives. Um, but what can we actually say ab about this? So we, we've uh, published a paper in, in Jay's 
uh, sort of penning our thoughts about this um, a couple of years ago, um, that uh, fundamentally we as a society have been targeting overutilization because overutilization is a low hanging fruit. It's easy to, easier to measure overutilization because you can look at differences in, in distribution intensity of services than it is to measure underutilization. And what does underutilization really mean? You know, we really aren't um, uh, going into the chart and identifying people who potentially have indications for echoes but didn't. Um, and, 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 and not to mention, it's, it's very hard, ultimately, at the end of the day, to separate the, the value of a proper diagnosis versus the treatment. And so the example is, is for example, ICDs and, uh, and, and EF. You know, is it, you know, we're very precise about our EF measurements. Well, if we better align our EF measurements with, with the data um, and allow people to, um, when, when they qualify to, to get ICDs, are we sort of appropriately distributing people to the right buckets. Um, and, but, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's harder to, to sort of separate that out from the ultimate treatment and the effects of the treatment, which is the ICD. Um, impact of mistakes uh, in ECHO are much harder to, to measure. You know, at the end of the day, what, is, what represents your ground truth to, for comparison? We use cardiac MRI, but I think um, you know, Joao is in the audience. I, I, many of us who read cardiac MRIs, I read cardiac MRIs myself, it, it, can be, it can be challenging. And we often are referring back to the echo to see what, what is um, in, in cross-comparing imaging uh, when, when, it, when it's challenging. And so what ultimately is, is ground truth? And at the end of the day, if you call something on an echo or an echo or, or an imaging report, um, what, um, you know, what's the consequence? And if it's, and it's a mistake, what's the consequence of that mistake? And who, who deems it a mistake, per se? Um, and, and so that's, um, makes all of these things make it very, very challenging to study outcomes in this, in this sphere. Um, but it's nevertheless, we, I think it's important to both justify the cost and the inconvenience to our patients of, of, of testing to really understand how, we, um, how, how our imaging modalities relate to outcomes. And we can learn a lot of things from this. So we can use imaging um, a, as an actual biomarker, and we can also use outcomes to understand parts about imaging. So we can use, for example, imaging as a bio biomarker for, for preoperative risk stratification. You could use it to guide in, uh, shared decision making with patients, to guide use of treatments and other diagnostic tests, and to really understand cardiac structure uh, and, and function. Um, and, and then there's the sort of test stepping back a bit, and we were talking this, about this a little bit at our dinner last night, about how uh, images at their fund most fundamental form are, are just ones and zeros. They, they're fundamentally sort of high resolution data arrays and you can use that and, uh, and put them into sort of machine learning um, types of uh, analyses to be able to identify, um, to cl classify things. And, and so we can use this as high resolution data arrays to classify outcomes, to classify um, people as, um, as high risk or low risk in, in addition to sort of um, calculating EF. Um, and then we can also use imaging as, as a surrogate outcome for trials and other uh, studies, and this has already started to be done, but looking at LV mass or LGE, for instance, or late gallium enhancement as, as a, a surrogate outcome for, uh, instead of clinical outcomes for, for studies. And the same is true um, in, in really in understanding imaging in that we can use uh, variation in imaging modalities and outcomes related to that variation to really understand, um, to, to understand the, to the core elements of what constitutes variation, what, what variation is important or not important. And we can use outcomes to identify areas of underutilization um, and, and ultimately use outcomes to define, I, I think, uh, nor normality. You know, our, our normal data is based on two standard deviations from the mean uh, in a, a normal healthy population, um, but it's not based on risk. And so maybe we should be targeting or using risk to help define how we, um, how we ultimately um, call something normal or, or abnormal. And, and, and so a, an example of this um, and, and something we're sort of actively working on is, is looking at aging and, and diastolic function. We all know um, that above age 60, your transmitral Doppler patterns change from a, a, an, an E-wave or early diastolic predominant pattern to a, a late diastolic pa pattern. And, but if it happens in the majority of the population, is it pathologic? Um, and, and what constitutes really abnormal aging from that perspective um, uh, people at risk for heart failure hospitalization, for instance, versus, um, for, versus normal aging. And so that's one of those circumstances where heart failure hospitalization can help us understand what are the parameters, the guideline param cutoff parameters that actually constitute uh, abnormal uh, uh, aging. So um, this is a big data talk. Um, 
uh, as Mark mentioned, this is, uh, this is really its, it's fundamental core in, in big data and, and why. Um, and I think it's also worth commenting on why we need these large data sources to really look at this. And one is that ultimately outcomes of interest to cardiology, thankfully, are, are uncommon. We do a good job um, at keeping our patients out of the hospital for the most part. Um, and, and so uh, the outcomes that we, we ultimately want to study are uncommon. So you need larger data sets to really look at them. There's also some fundamental st statistical reasons that you could do this. So unless we collect outcomes in a biased fashion, um, if you if you collect continuous data, for instance, in, in large numbers, your sample um, continuous data in large numbers, eventually you're, you're going to get a number that approaches what the population mean is. And in all, in all our statistical inferences, we're, we're ultimately, at the end of the day, we're, we're taking a sample and applying the, that sample to make an inference about a population. But the larger the numbers we have, the closer we actually get to what the population means are, and the more precision we have in our estimates of those population means. Um, and, uh, and, and, and this is possible. So um, I like to tell the story, but in, in the 1970s, uh, logistic regression was too challenging for a, a laptop or, or a, a computer to, to really feasibly be able to do. It's an iterative approach, unlike things like a linear regression, which can be solved within, um, within the uh, equation itself. Uh, logistic regression requires sort of estimating maximal likelihood and then iterating through it to be able to actually get the sort of maximal, true maximal likelihood. Now I can do this, you know, I, I can run a, a machine learning uh, algorithm, a random forest, on, on my laptop in about 30 seconds. And so the, the technology and the explosion of technology has, I think, permitted um, large data uh, set analysis. Um, the, the, what we're missing really is the data. Um, and, and so the, we do have um, a couple in the works, and I'll talk about this, but large multi-center registries that ultimately um, can sort of improve the generalizability of our, of our results. I think, you know, we're, we're all interested in generalizability, but, you know, I think that we're still in this mode in, in imaging where we're, we're still, in many ways, publishing single center series. And, and we, we need to get away from that and move towards a common um, uh, understanding of, of, um, of data across institutions so that we understand uh, what things are generalizable and what things, what things are, are not. And I think in those large groups, then you, then you have the ability to be able to really understand the, the effect and how the effects continue into, um, into subgroups. And so this is, you know, we're fortunate in that um, these data repositories are increasingly being built. And, and, and in fact, actually, um, um, medicine increasingly is moving towards being an information science. And so we, we collect all this data in the course of our care. Um, but increasingly don't necessarily analyze uh, that data, that there's been, there, there are lots of silos of data that haven't been linked together to really create that um, rich data architecture that you can use to leverage to answer some of these questions. So um, I'm not gonna focus on the slide this year, just there, there are limitations and, um, and advantages of, of all the different types of, of data sources and, and uh, self-report, and, and it's um, worth, worthwhile, I think, if you're interested in this topic, um, sort of reading through through this eventually. Um, but so how do, working with imaging data is challenging. Um, it's, it's challenging for all the reasons that I mentioned to you, but it's challenging for other reasons as well that are unique to the imaging data specifically. And, and so um, this is just some things, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, the data is really only actionable if the diagnosis or misdiagnosis is actually recognized by the clinician and acted upon. Um, so that creates a, a, real, a real challenge. Um, you know, ultimately, most of what we're using is, is report data. That report data comes from the actual reports that get filed with the patient's chart and are acted upon. So they're closest to those outcomes, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, they're right. Um, and, and there's large amounts of missing data. And in some cases, that can be normal. You know, I, I, I can tell you when I read, um, I, if, if there's something that's been measured incorrectly, I, I won't, you know, I, if I can measure it, correctly, I'll measure it correctly. But if I can't, because I haven't been given the right images to do it in the first place, I won't. And I won't report that data. And so we have, um, we have large amounts of missing data. Um, and, and that creates you know, some, some issues as well for sort of looking at um, uh, data analysis. Um, there are hi hierarchical data structures. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, 
a, a given person can have multiple echoes, and those echoes can have multiple modalities, and those, um, that given person exists in a clinic, and that clinic can have a different pattern of echoes than a different clinic in a different hospital, et cetera. And so this, this happens in routine care anyway, and there are statistical ways for adjusting for how this affects the, the standard errors and in, in, in making inferences about this in your population. But, uh, but this exists as a core element of imaging data because of the way that we, um, we, we image people. Um, there's large amounts of collinearity. So your LV, what do I mean by that? So your, your LV diameter is very similar to your LV volume. Um, and, or your end diastolic volume is going to be very similar to your end systolic volume. You put both of them in the equation, one's going to pop out um, as being non-significant because they're, they're so closely related. And so there's a huge amount of, of collinearity with, 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 with imaging data. Um, there are differences in variable names and conventions. And some of this is standardized uh, already. There was a, there was a really nice um, um, article by Pam Douglas and others um, um, standardized, helping to standardize the variable names and conventions for imaging data. Uh, but, but every center does things, despite that, sort of a little bit uniquely. And so when you're then creating a registry, how do you create a registry? Well, you have to go and map the variables from one to the other. That takes a lot of manual effort. Um, and, and it takes somebody who understands imaging data to really sort of map those variables to understand that. Um, there can be data entry errors. This came up all, all the time. How do you know that the data is, is accurate? Well, I, I, I don't. I'm taking it ultimately at face value, but there are some things we can do. We can put limits, for example, on the extremes of the data, you know, things that are clearly non-physiologic, and, and, and we can clean, clean the data, so to speak. Um, we, can, we can do, and, and I, I'm sort of increasingly advocating um, for a, a core lab approach, which is that you sort of um, identify, randomly select some studies from each site, and then review them. Um, and so you can really understand what the interobserver variability is in, in, within the data and actually have somebody who's a sort of core lab lo look at that and understand where the, where the, the pain points are. But, but ultimately, you know, the data entry errors still got in, into uh, somebody's chart. Um, and so when you, th when you think about it at the end of the day, that, that, is, uh, that is real, real data. Um, and then there are different study types within a given modality. So you, for example, echo, you know, CE, transthoracic, stress echo, and so it complicates things a bit further. Um, large amounts of unstructured data. So we've been lo very lucky at BI, um, and I understand here as well, um, is, is to have a very, very structured data set where, where things like bicuspid aortic valve, if you want to study it, are, are, are a structured field that you can query. Um, or aortic valve VTI, you could, you could query. That's not the case in a lot of cases. In, in, in many cases, uh, image reports are PDFs, and, and so having to go through PDFs and pull out that data becomes all the more challenging. And part this particularly is the case with indications. We've noticed this in an image guide echo registry working with across um, different sites is that most sites have free text indications. And so then it becomes really challenging. You could use natural language processing and all these sort of other things to parse out that data, but it becomes challenging. Not to mention, if you ultimately want to use images in, in your data, you know, the size and complexity is, is, is huge. So we just are, are part, we, we recently got a grant from the Massachusetts uh, Life Sciences Division to build, um, um, and I'll talk about this, but uh, build the next iteration of the so-called MIMIC data set, to set, which is a, um, an ICU data set, but has sort of comprehensive information on labs, meds, um, et, et, et cetera, outcomes, et cetera, for, for the people who are involved. We recently um, got a grant to, to fund the creation of, a, of uh, ECHO data for this. Um, but um, several terabytes of, of data later, you know, you get to put a price on, on what this actually means, and, and buying um, storage for this is not small. And so then you apply that to a national level, and you think about how do you do this with, if, we, you know, if, if this is 30,000 echoes, how do you do this with 3 million echoes um, going forward? And so it, um, it, it becomes problematic. And, and then, uh, you know, this is something we, we often don't wrestle with, but, but, but should be p potentially, is that at the end of the day, people got an image test because they were referred in. And so they are fundamentally different from the people who weren't referred in. And, and that, um, I think, creates a, a, a somewhat of a selection bias um, in how we, how we do this. We have to think, um, I think, consciously about how, we, how, how and which data sources we, we take for, to answer certain questions. Um, and then there can be le leakage. So I, I practice in, in, in Boston. We have lots of uh, great medical centers in Boston. But, um, but you know, my patient at BI can certainly walk across the street to Brigham and get an echo there. And I don't know anything about that. And, and that's a, a problematic thing when you're studying a, a disease long term, because ultimately they, they can have care that's out of network. 
that you're not capturing. And, and all the more reinforces why we need these sort of local and national um, uh, registries to, to understand um, our gaps here. So what do we have and what do we... Uh, what, what have we created so far? So we have, we have a wonderful data set. Like I said, this is, um, I, I'm very blessed to, to have structured data fields. So um, back in the year 2000, Pam Douglas, when she was um, the um, Echo Lab director at BI, um, created an, an Echo reporting software um, with, with a guy named Larry, Larry Markson, um, who was at, time, at the time in, in IT, and it was a homegrown reporting system, um, but stored all the information from the echoes in, in, uh, in a SQL data set that you can query. And, and um, this was supposed to be for a Y2K project, hence the year 2000. And it ended up lasting to year 2018 before we finally retired. And, uh, um, but so in total, it's about 271,000 echoes on 135,000 individuals over the course of, of time. Um, and, and what we've done is, is, as a data set, we've linked that to about 26,000 deaths in the Social Security Death Master file. And then the subset of those who are Medicare enrolled, we've actually linked to our own Medicare claims uh, to 100% fee-for-service claims for Medicare 2003 to 2017. So, so what does that mean? So it includes a, um, echo reports on about 64,000 individuals. Um, and we have claims algorithms that we've built from, from sort of a lot of validation work we've used. Um, we, we've, we've compared um, claims that are um, in, uh, uh, um, submitted uh, for, for patients to the actual core lab adjudicated outcomes in, in some trials like the, um, the core valve trials, and we have ongoing work in this area, and we've done a lot of sort of validation work to understand what are the real claims algorithms we can use to be able to, to look at outcomes that we are meaningful to us in, in cardiology, like MACE or acute MI or heart failure or stroke, and what are, what's reliable, what's not reliable. Now we've built that, and so we have about 20 outcomes um, uh, to, to be able to look at, and we, we, we have um, about 23 clinical covariates that we've actually been able to get from Medicare CCW claims. Is this, this is what Medicare uses, also using validated algorithms that have been published, um, using both inpatient and outpatient claims to identify people with chronic comorbid diseases. And they use this to study population trends, et cetera. But we can use it to, to generate clinical covariates, things like smoking, hypertension, and diabetes, um, which, are, which are often missing in our ECHO um, data sets. And then, uh, and then we can use other data sets. So this is the MIMIC data, which I talked about, uses um, clinical and lab data from 60,000 ICU admissions. MIMIC 3, which is the most recent iteration. And this is all publicly available. You can access this on their website and download and use it for your research. Um, MIMIC 3 is, uh, features 350,000 de-identified chest x-ray, DICOM images, linked to clinical data and patient information from over 260,000 ED visits. And they've used this already to be able to validate an algorithm to look to detect um, pulmonary edema on a chest x-ray. And MIMIC-4, which I mentioned is in development, will add about 145,000 echoes as well as 980,000 EKGs. So we're really going to be have a, able to have a really unique way of, of looking at you know, what things on EKG can predict what on echo, and what, what are we, what's, what's the added value of the echo in many of these circumstances to the set of other additional tests that we, we're, we're doing. Um, there's also a number of other uh, existing registries. So the SMR registry, um, I would be one if I didn't mention it, is about 62,000 cardiac MRIs. Um, uh, the image guide registry, which I'm, I'm uh, coming on as, as co-chair of the registry in, in July, um, uh, is, is split between ASC and ASNIC. It was originally sort of an ASNIC um, approach, and then ASC has is, is since joined. Um, and, th and this is building. It's about 30,000 um, studies in. Uh, and we're adding our data as well, so we'll have another two, so 270,000 plus the, um, our, our ongoing uh, data as well, and, and, and Penn, is, Penn is joining as well. So this is, this is rapidly carrying steam, and I think very soon we'll have enough data to really be able to, to make some inferences off of, uh, of this. Um, UK Biobank is, is there. It has tons of data. And, and I do want to sort of especially call out um, you know, the, the NETA data, um, because I do think it's important. So NETA is, is um, a collaborators from uh, from Australia have, have built a, a machine learning algorithm that takes the reads in the echo report data, filters it out using sort of core um, uh, cleaning criteria, and then ultimately um, um, puts it into common variable names. Um, and they've done this for over 40 million echo reports across 14 lab, labs in Australia. And they have that link to the, the national death data in Australia, which is fairly accurate. So they have about 60,000 deaths. And so this is really a, you know, a, a huge uh, data set and the largest data, echo data set that I know of in the world. 
Um, and then there's also um, government federated data networks, so things like Sentinel Network or Cornet or NIH Collaboratory. And what these are are local individual sites that decide that they want to, to share their, their data. And even though the data itself lives locally, um, if somebody has a request, they send it out to the group and the, um, an algorithm goes across and, and says for each center, do you want to participate in this study? And if they say yes, it, it sort of captures that data, pulls in the relevant data from that institution and analyzes it. So it avoids the whole data sharing issue that people have um, to, to begin with, but, but also collects these large wealth of, of information. Um, so um, what are some of the existing challenges? Well, um, it's expensive, um, and it's really expensive. I can tell you as, as now the co-chair of the registry, it's expensive. Um, so um, National Quality uh, Registry Network put a number on this, and they surveyed about 152 societies um, uh, uh, back in 2017, and looking at sort of what types, they, what types of data they get from, from uh, registry data. And, 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 and uh, most of it is process data, sort of um, about, but about three quarters of it is 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 um, is outcomes data. Um, very little in terms of cost and personalized medicine. You can see at the bottom of the list, not a whole lot going on there. Um, but a lot more planning to use those other things. Particularly, you can see six percent using uh, using looking at cost right now. Fifty three percent interested in it. So there's about a, a fifty percent response rate. Um, but a third spent up to a, a million or more, um, up to nine, almost ten million uh, per year on. Um, these registries. Um, the average registry had three full-time employees. Um, you can think about the cost of all this. 88% still used manual data entry. So, you know, I can tell you that the, when, when it came on initially to the image guide echo registry, we were, we were trying to manually, you know, put in data, and that was, it was not, it was not going anywhere. Um, and, and when you think about each study having to enter an individual study for um, multiple studies per patient, that, that's a real barrier. Um, only 18% were linked to external data sources, so there's a real, there's a gap um, there. And it's mostly using for QI, for benchmarking, for cl clinical decision support. The biggest um, barriers that they identified for sort of continued development were cost, interoperability, and, and ultimately sort of vendor um, management. So really what I've, I've been describing to you thus far is really the, a, a separate field, and it's really a sort of a multidisciplinary field that I think we really need in, in, in um, cardiac imaging, which is, which is really has a several, several aims. So one is to sort of evaluate the relationship of cardiac structure to health outcomes. One is to, two is to sort of uh, use, evaluate the use of imaging to, uh, to guide medical decision making. So not just improving diagnosis, but how do we use that to guide decision making and prognostication. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I, if I didn't mention um, people in the room who, who've really worked and their you know, core elements of their careers on this for, for many years. Um, and then um, understanding the cost, use, and, and sources of variation in cardiac imaging practice. There's a real need to really uh, look at what we're doing and, and, and identify what's the optimal imaging interval what, and what are the cost effectiveness uh, and diagnostic strategies related to imaging. And then ultimately, at the end of the day, it's, it's conduct trials uh, of different strategies of, of, of imaging. Um, and so this is really, you know, it's a hybrid field, and, and I think it's a, a, a multidisciplinary field that in incorporates, so epi, biostats, cost effectiveness research, but also a lot of data science. Um, things like machine learning, database management, uh, relational database management tools that, that are almost in sort of the informatics realm that, are, uh, that we need to be able to sort of integrate these different uh, variety of data sources, structured and unstructured data, um, into, into a common repository. And so I'm going to put a sort of a real world um, bent on this by talking about a case. Um, and so this is a, a, a hypothetical 72-year-old um, with, with all of the cardiac risk factors and moderate aortic stenosis with an AVA of 1.3 who's presenting for dyspnea on exertion for a year. Um, he's had no significant progression in, in his aortic valve area, but his with the F is low. And, um, his coronary angiogram didn't show any obstructive coronary disease, and he had a stress test uh, he had limiting uh, dyspnea at five mets, so very low effort, no EKG changes, no changes on his EKG, and then the, the CPET demonstrated a cardiac limitation. And so, you know, it's, it, is, this, is this true symptomatic moderate AS, I guess is the, the point of the, the question, um, and what's the attributable risk of mortality due to moderate AS in, in the setting? And so I think it's a really it's an interesting case point to understanding this, um, this very important question. Um, and should we, under, should we consider AVRs in this population? I think as a society, we, um, we really don't completely understand that yet. So everybody knows this curve. So Ross and Bronwell, 1968, seminal pub publication looking at um, uh, 
the long latent period that exists before the onset of symptoms and then the, the, the median rate of death uh, of aortic stenosis patients was, was very um, uh, steep after that without uh, repair. And, and what I like to, to, to do is look at the, look, call people's attention to the average age of death here. Um, so first of all, this is a very small cohort that they actually used. Um, it was the best available that they had at the time, and this was really impressive work. I mean, they were just at the time figuring out how to actually judge the severity of AS using a diagnostic cath. And so this is really ahead of its time. But you know, the average age was 63. So this was a large mix of bicuspid, rheumatic, and calcific AS. It wasn't the population that we treat nowadays. And there's no way that they had the, the the large population that they needed to be, to, to be able to look at mortality, particularly if mortality is uncommon in the less significant subgroups. And there might have been some diagnostic error, potentially, in the quantification of um, the, the, the severity of the AAS, in part because these were all new techniques. Um, but of course, we have other data since that time. Um, and, and so there's, there's um, lots of, of other natural history data. But as you can see here, the numbers are actually relatively small. Um, these are the some natural history studies that I was able to identify of um, severe AS. And then, um, and then this, is, this is moderate AS. So there's a couple of studies that I wanted to bring up of moderate AS. Um, this is the Said study from BMJ. 316 asymptomatic patients with moderate to severe AS who underwent stress echo. And it turns out that if you had symptoms on stress echo, whether or not you had moderate or you had severe AS, you had, you had bad uh, outcomes. Um, and so maybe there's something about preempting symptoms and uh, the outcome of mortality, which is 67% cardiovascular related or, 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 um, or ABR, they were followed for three years. And, and during serial testing, symptoms identify 55% of people with moderate AS as, ha as, as having ultimately you know, um, uh, relevant um, disease. Symptom-free survival at 24 months was, was much worse. Um, um, you know, it's, it's not severe AS, um, but, uh, but it was... It was, it was poor, for sure. Um, this is a, a great study by Rosenek and colleagues looking at 176 asymptomatic patients with mild to moderate AS with, uh, with, with moderate um, disease here. Um, over about four years, they evaluated hemodynamic progression and looked at death or AVR compared to age, gender, uh, match controls in the population. And, and the event-free survival was only 55% at, at five years if the velocity was, was, was above three. Um, and of course, that includes many people who potentially um, you know, had, had close to, to severe AS, but not quite severe AS. But was, and there were 34 deaths. 15 of those were cardiovascular. Um, severe AS was only demonstrated in about 7 of 15 of them pre-mortem, so of, of those 15 pre-mortem. And so you wonder whether or not the, the rest progressed to severe AS and just didn't, weren't able to demonstrate that, um, or if there's something else going on. Um, so this is what I have uh, so far in terms of what's been published in, in the um, uh, data so far on, on moderate AS. And you can see, it, by and large, in the numbers, except for the strange study, which I'll talk about in a, in a second, is, is relatively small numbers. But the cons and across, in and, and a lot of different definitions in terms of how we define severe AS, but across the, the follow-up, uh, mortality is poor. It's very poor. And, and the real question is, is it just the company it cap keeps, or, or, is it, or is it the disease itself? And this is just another one that I, um, I added to this slide because it um, just came out in, in JACE this past year, so hot off the press. Um, 229 patients with, with any degree of aortic stenosis and two or more echoes, they looked at those who had non-severe aortic stenosis and had rapid progression, which they defined as greater than 0.3 meters per second per year increase in aortic uh, peak velocity. And they had similar mortality to those who had severe aortic stenosis at baseline. And what's more interesting also, and this has been confirmed in other data as well, is if you looked at um, those with non-severe AS, uh, over time, they had a drop in their ejection fraction, despite the fact that their ejection fractions were still largely in the normal range. If you look at it serially over time, it was a decline from what their baseline value was. Um, so that sort of brings me to, to this article I was, I was mentioning at dinner last night uh, by Bronwald and, 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 and others, and, and really puts this into historical perspective. Bronwald talked about the TAVR era and how this has really transformed uh, aortic valve replacement. And, and go goes on to talk about the historical operative mortality for aortic valve replacement at the early days of being upwards of 15%. And the decision to, to make the cut, cutoff for, for AVR as the development of symptoms in severe AS was in part based on the risk of surgery that was above. But of course, here we are um, in, in 2021, the current operative mortality in the lowest risk population in, in, in the partner A trial was, was 1%. And so we're really 
um, at, at, at a, a completely different paradigm change. And, and the real question is whether or not the, the, the risk-benefit ratio shifts in favor of earlier intervention, much as it has to, with mitral disease as we've gotten better with our techniques. And so this is in part being studied, and, and um, the Tavron Load study is enrolling now and is, is taking people with sapien-3 um, um, transcatheter heart valves and heart failure uh, who have heart failure and moderate aortic stenosis. And, uh, but, but in fact, there's a number of also different trials ongoing um, in, in asymptomatic severe AS, and, and many people already know about the results of the early TAVR um, trial, um, and so uh, su suggesting that there may be a benefit to, towards intervention in, in asymptomatic severe disease as well. So the question is, are people undergoing ventricular changes during this time, and, and could you prevent those ventricular changes potentially if you, um, if you um, um, enrolled up front? So, so this was a paper that was published. It was a controversial one that was published um, um, in 2019 in JAK. Um, adjusting for age, sex, aortic regurgitation, EF, and stroke volume index. This is the paper from uh, Jeff Strange and colleagues from that NEDA data showing that if those who had a, a aortic stenosis as they defined using gradients um, of greater than 40 were very similar in terms of their mortality risk of those who had moderate disease. And that was true if you adjusted for aortic valve area as well. And they found that there was a more mortality inflection point by around 20 millimeters of mercury. And so, you know, I. This didn't come out well, unfortunately. But I, I have a, I had a lot of concerns about this when it initially came out because I, I was concerned about a number of different things. Um, one of, and I think the biggest thing is, is this the, is the moderate AS the issue or is it the company it keeps? But I also was, um, you know, was concerned because they used their last echo as, as ultimately sort of the baseline. And what that can do, I think, if you look at that naively, when you're not looking at the time time that people spend in the mild range before they get their initial echo. If their initial echo is severe, you basically are discounting all the time they spent in the moderate and mild range. And so potentially, you know, with this progressive disease, you're, under, you're overestimating risk relative to, 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 to other people. And so, so I was concerned about that, but also, um, um, but also there's, a real, there's a real scientific question. Um, if, you, if you look back in the data, the Rosenheck and Lancelotti studies, um, all those who had an aortic valve um, uh, replacement had severe AS preoperatively, and on the one hand, non-cardiac death is very, very high in the moderate AS group as well, so people die from other things. But moderate AS was still associated with higher mortality than age, sex, comorbidity-adjusted controls. Half of the deaths in the Rosenheck study didn't have severe AS, and if there isn't an associated risk, it's probably small. And so you need large numbers to really be able to define that and to detect that risk. And, and I think there's a little bit of an ascertainment bias. We all know the Bromwell data, it's burned into our brain. And so um, when we see somebody with cardiac arrest who has moderate AS, we don't necessarily reach for the moderate AS as being a culprit. We think, we think of the, um, the severe AS. We're not necessarily routinely doing autopsies on people in the population who may not present to medical attention. Um, and there's, there's, there's a certain confirmation bias. And so I, I, I'm not saying that I, I, moderate AS necessarily increases um, um, causes death and, and people are dro dropping like flies, but I, but I think it's, 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 there's enough of a, a, an equipoise that I think it's worth further study. Is, is, and, and so I, I approached Jeff about this and we said, well, you know, we have, a, we have this really uniquely rich data set. We have an opportunity to really be able to address some of the flaws that I think were inherent in the analysis, and, and I'd really love to see whether or not we can reproduce this data and validate it in a, different, in a completely different setting. And so this is the sort of rationale behind that, but we, you know, they have a large multi-center um, cohort um, it's academic plus community sites. It's all age groups. Um, they, they have cause of death information, cardiovascular specific death, um, and they have predominantly sort of outpatient uh, echoes. We have um, a single center analysis, but very granular, well phenotyped. We know all their labs and meds and uh, et cetera. It was only 65 and older because we have the Medicare population where we have that information on. Um, but we have non-death outcomes and we have uh, a predominantly sort of inpatient group. And so it's a complementary, both of them um, we have them linked to outcomes, and we have a lot of extensive echo data. So we, we set about to sort of do the well, what is what is hopefully will be the largest study of um, aortic stenosis, and and so this is um, you know kindly supported by Edwards because um, they're they're very interested, of course, as you can imagine, in, in the answer to this question. Um, and what we're we're looking at, or what we have done, I should say, is is using time dependent covariates. So people only get credit for. Uh, with AS for the time that they spend in each severity stage. So what the sort of a typical interpretation of a hazard ratio is, you have some risk factors at baseline. That hazard ratio is the risk applied over the subsequent follow-up period uh, you know, broadly. Whereas uh, with a time-varying interpretation, you're really only giving credit for the time that they, they ultimately 
spend in, in each stage. And so you can really understand what's the sort of true instantaneous risk. So I'm very excited. Well, um, we, have, we have a little data to, pre to present to you, which is great. Um, so um, all in all, we've, and this has not been presented publicly yet, so I'm curious for all your, your opinions, but we, we took out people who had, so we had looked at people who had aortic valve profiling by echo um, and took out people who had um, an aortic, prior aortic valve replacement um, and, and looked at about 30, 31,000 mark group and about 217,000 people from their, their group um, over the course of sort of 1.1 million years of follow-up. And this is sort of where it breaks down in, in terms of um, classifications of, of severity. Um, and you can see severe, about half in the severe high gradient, low gradient AS. And we, we use the proportion that had aortic valve areas to sort of reclassify those, those people into sort of the standard uh, clinical stages. Um, and, uh, and this is what we've found so far. So this is really fascinating and interesting, but um, just to show that it, with increasing e aortic peak velocity, there is a gradual but in, uh, commensurate increase in risk up to about the moderate stage. And once you reach the moderate stage, it sort of plateaus and that the severe high and low gradient actually had similar, um, similar somewhat risks and that, were, that were ultimately similar to those with, with moderate. And this is adjusted for, this is for all cause mortality, which is adjusted for age, sex, echo characteristics and over 30 la clinical lab and, and treatment variables, including uh, evidence of coronary heart disease, ischemic heart disease, and, and cancer, which were sort of, and dementia, which are sort of main confounders, clinical confounders that we really didn't feel that were present previously. Um, and um, so if you just look at this, and everybody loves take CAM curves, so this is um, the, the CAM curve for Australia. This is our CAM curve um, uh, in, in Boston, and you can look at, um, so ours is adjusted for a whole lot more than theirs is, but theirs is adjusted for what, they, what data they had. And you can see that, that here, this is severe AS and this is moderate. And, and these are really, really almost superimposable. In fact, the line, you can't even see there's another line in our data because it's, um, you may not be able to see it on the screen because it's literally su superimposable. Um, so what about, okay, well, this is a, a gradient-based classification system based on peak velocities. Are you getting bleed-through of people who have a severe low gradient um, in, in the, those other populations? So we said, well, okay, we'll do, do the traditional-based classification. And this is what we found, um, which is uh, NEAS is bad. So that's, I think, a, a resounding um, point. But that also that there's a continuum of increased risk and that the moderates were at a, at a similar risk to those with, with severe uh, disease. And, and maybe that's because ultimately this is a, a, this is a five year time point. And so maybe it's because some of the people developed severe AS and they didn't have an interval echo. And, and so this is attributable to the very severe AS. Or maybe it's the company that, that they, they keep. But, but, but at the end of the day, it suggests that this, pop, this population is a high risk population. And it suggests that we should be monitoring them closely. And it suggests that we should be um, uh, looking at them closely as potentially for. Uh, uh, for, for whether or not they are candidates for, for treatment or ultimately getting them plugged into treatment. Um, and so we also looked at this across subgroups. So first versus last echo didn't make a difference. Um, we adjusted for time and stage versus not adjusted didn't make a difference. We looked at, quite, and in the Australian group, we looked at cardiovascular specific death, same pattern that we found. Uh, age under 65 in their group, same pattern that they found. Uh, we looked at uh, those who had heart failure. So we don't have symptoms, unfortunately. But we did look at heart failure and coronary disease, whether or not they had uh, a prevalent disease beforehand. And there was a significant interaction there. Um, and, and essentially, once you developed heart failure or coronary disease, it didn't matter what a AS severity you had, your, your, your mortality was, was poor um, um, across the board. And, and I think it also goes to show the sort of um, the importance of gradients to underlying risk. Adjusting for aortic valvular is a continuous variable. You still had an increased risk um, uh, of mortality. And so maybe that implies that what matters is not necessarily the orifice size, but what the ventricle sees in terms of um, it, 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 the, the downstream effects on, on outcomes. Um, and then, uh, we, interestingly enough, we did found disparities. So um, um, there, were, there was increased um, risk in the, in the black population and there was um, a lower rate of death in, in females, uh, which has been identified in other studies. So I put this up here is just because this is not a prescription. And, you know, th this is real world data, and this is intended as real world data. And, and what this means is, you know, it's the best substitute. It's not a trial. And, and ultimately, we shouldn't. We should be cautious about how we use and interpret this, this kind of data. And just to, this is the correlation between letters and the, the winning uh, word of the script national spelling bee and the number killed by, by, by venomous spiders per year, of course. Clearly, um, correlation does not equal causation. And, and similarly, risk is not benefit. 
And so just because somebody's at high risk of something doesn't necessarily mean they could be high risk of one procedure but also another. And so it, it do, or, you know, one stru treatment strategy or another. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they would have benefit from AVRs. And we need to do these trials ultimately to be able to uh, figure it out. But the trials are on firm footing to, to do this. So in summary, um, you know, we have, we have a lot rising costs in cardiac imaging that force our hand to really understand what, how we use outcomes data to understand um, uh, imaging and, and understand care gaps. Um, and that really outcomes research represents sort of a unique discipline in and of itself. Um, and um, and the AS is a powerful use case, but we, we, we need to interpret the results with caution. Thank you very much. Thanks for that was a great talk, and thanks for sharing that uh, upcoming data or the uh, yeah, uh, new sure. So, uh, open up to questions. Excellent talk, Jordy. Thank um, you. Very interesting about the the last uh, few slides that you had shared. If I understood correctly, it seems that the U.S. population, for a given same degree of aortic stenosis, has a higher risk than the Australian population. Um, is that related to who we are here as the United States or where we live? Yeah, it's, it's something we, we went back and forth about as a group, you know, talking all, quite a bit about. And I think ultimately we came down to the fact that our, our catchment population is a largely inpatient catchment population. And so you're, you're getting the risk of people who are having, um, you know, echoes during their inpatient hospitalization, et cetera, versus theirs, which is which largely an outpatient community site. So, I mean, just goes to show that I think we, we, we need more... We need broader representation. This is a single center. We really need a general, a generalizable echo data set to be able to evaluate this. Yeah, it was was good, very good. Um, everything in, that we do is context. So you've proven by the difference in survival between uh, Australia and the U.S. It's the context that it's inpatient, outpatient. Right. So um, the issue for us is to define the context. Yeah. Context of comorbidity how much comorbidity you measure, context of frailty, context of symptoms. Yeah. So um, the Australian database left me a little cool yeah, because okay. they don't have any context. Yeah. They have echoes. Yeah. So if you put imaging in isolation, it's meaningless in terms of what we do as doctor. Yeah. So how do you address this issue of context? Well, it's an interesting, I mean, I think it gets to the, you're, you're absolutely right, and I think it gets to the issues of these fundamental referral biases. Um, and, and I think it, you know, it's really hard to address those because at the end of the day, people got an echo, um, and people got an echo for the indications for which they got those echoes. And um, so it's a really, it's a really, really good and, and, and a challenging uh, question to deal with, but at the end of the day, it, you, you, th these are the data that, that people ultimately acted, acted on, and and so um, people might have had an echo for evaluation of tamponade, and they happen to see moderate AS, but it ultimately becomes part of their evaluation and diagnosis that they had moderate AS. And so they have cancer, and they have tamponade because they have cancer, and they died because of the cancer. <laughs> right. And, and, and so, with AS. Yeah. And so with, with AS. Without, without context, we're... And just one comment, by the way, the curve of, of uh, brown wall. Yeah. You're, you're from Boston. People don't to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an imaginary line. Yeah. You know, it's it's autopsy. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is all necropsy data. They so collected the so. patient when they were dead. So what do they know about what happened before death? So it's imaginary. It's well imagined. It's fun. It it uh, it penetrated a lot of brains, but it's imagination. Yeah. It's uh, the Italians say if it's not true, it's well told. <laughs> so, I mean, this, this is, you know, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. And, and this all originated, a study actually originated because um, Jeff Popma approached me, and we were talking about this last night at dinner, saying, saying you know, Medtronic, you know, ultimately we're forging ahead, right? And, and, and Medtronic um, sa said, well, we're, we're, we're doing a study on, on moderate AS, we're doing a trial. We have no idea how to power it because we need the observational data to really understand what the event rate could poten potentially or theoretically be. Because I agree with you. I mean, I, I, in my clinical practice, my clinical reasoning tells me there are not moderate AS patients that are, that are dropping like flies, um, you know, because of their moderate AS. And so I, my, I really, you know, that fundamentally come back to that, and, and I, I am concerned about that kind of data. But at but the, but the end, you know, we see, we see risk, 
we have to at least acknowledge that the risk is present regardless of all of the caveats that, 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 that go, go into it. Um, and so then how do, you, how, do you best, you know, how do you best deal with that risk and understand the sources of it? And, and, and I think the trials are the right way to do it is to really understand is, uh, who benefits from a procedure or, or not. And until we're changing our clinical practice, you know, we're, 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 we're not going to, unless we get the results of that, we're not going to be changing, changing the clinical practice. You know, the other question that comes up is, is there a group of moderate IS patients who does represent a high risk group for which um, you know, there, would be a, there would be a benefit for AVR, even if the trials are negative. Um, and so I, I do think it's, a, it's, it's worth thinking about how we, how we move in the direction. But you're right, this, all this data is, is, is complicated. Well, thank you, it's an enormous undertaking. It <laughs> hurts my brain to think about that. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, all healthcare is local, and there may be very specific uh, differences in one health system. And when we think about looking at our own selves and how do we do better and make choices, uh, we have to be able to fund this kind of information. How generalizable do you think a lot of what you do is? And then how do you think about local health systems and what they should do? Yeah, it's a really, really, really important topic. I, I, I come back to the fact that it's still a single center echo data. Um, and, and it can be the largest you know, most extensive database in the world, single, still single center. And so in terms of talking about generalizability, I've been thinking about this a lot more recently. And, and, um, and I do think that there are important other data sources. So I've started to um, look into using CHS data, for instance, um, because it is, I think, more, more of a, 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 a population cohort. Um, and so it's, it is theoretically a little bit more generalizable. It's core, the echo labs are, echoes are, are core lab adjudicated. You know, here, you know, we can, core lab adjudicate in a subset, but there's no way we could be adjudicating a million echoes. And so um, I, I think those are, those are real criticisms. Um, and, and until we have more representation in these sort of broader national registries and international registries of echo data, I, I don't think we'll really understand that, the, the answer to that because at the end of the day, um, we might have a mean Left, atri you know, left atrial volume of 30 in, in this population and a mean of 20 in a different, or, or 50 in a different population. And what represents normal, in fact, it, it in part depends on how we've selected those normals. Um, and so uh, I think we really need broader data sets to be able to evaluate what is truly generalizable and not generalizable. But in any case, it's always, I always feel like this, this needs to be validated in another setting. And so that was one of our, our goals was to say, you know, this is, this is Australia. Their practice pattern is very, very different than, than, than ours. You know, do we even see the same signal? Um, and using sort of different techniques, do we even see the same signal? We do. So. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for your talk, Dr. Sure. Strong. We do have a few online questions, so hopefully if you can get sure. them. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the first of which is, have you approached EPIC or another EMR system to create a large international registry which would link imaging, inpatient, outpatient data? Ah, uh, yes. Um, EPIC, is, EPIC is great. Um, EPIC, um, theoretically, is, is the, sort of the goldmine of, of, of many of AHR data, because when you think about sort of real-world data, you know, they have eight, sort of 80% of the, the healthcare market in the country. Country, and and you know, and you think about the sort of broader, a uh, broad use. That you, there's there's even more benefit there. Uh, I think it as as of now, uh, access to to Epic data has been a challenge, um, and I think there are a lot of sites hoping to get access to to the ultimate data set. But it's it's been a real challenge um, in terms of what imaging data they have and how it's storing that data. It's a really good good point in question. Um, I, I don't think we really know yet because the, that hasn't really been defined. Epic is, is, has not been um, forthcoming about what data exists and how they'll, how they'll package it. Thank you for that. Um, sure. So one other question is, do you have any thoughts on the use of AI for interpretation of imaging when compared to human interpretation? Ah. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting, I mean, so there are a lot of theoretical benefits to using AI, uh, um, at least if not to completely, if not completely uh, read imaging, but, but, but also I, I, I think we were talking about this last night, I think it helped guide us and at least do sort of some of the, the, the measurements and do it in a more standardized fashion so that we realize that we're um, uh, getting more reproducible in, in values. Um, ultimately, I, at the end of the day, I do think there's gonna be a role for humans um, in, in, in adjudicating those results and for reviewing it and deciding if it's appropriate. Um, but, but I do think a lot of this, particularly sort of the, the database entry measurement data, 
uh, could be made a whole lot easier with the advent of routine, broad, broad-based AI use. Follow-up question to that is, if, if we were using AI, do you think that would have an effect on the overall cost of imaging? That's a really good question. Um, well, I guess it, the <laughs> cost is a, is a tough nut to crack because cost always depends on your perspective. Um, and, and so, you know, if you're a, a co company or a hospital purchasing um, the equipment for AI and their the companies are charging large sums of money to purchase it, 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 it may not be cost effective. Um, but from a societal standpoint, it may be. And, and, and I don't know th that we really have the answer to that yet because we don't have sort of routine algorithms that we're doing for this yet. So it's, it's ultimately, a, you know, that, that's a, one of the things that's sort of at the tip of the pyramid. We ultimately need to study that. But, but it's, we're, we start, first need to develop, uh, you know, demonstrate technical feasibility first before we uh, can move to those kinds of questions. Thank you. That's all the online questions. So. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Great, great way to end the season. Thank you.